Mr. Olu Bankole Wellington, popularly known as Banky W, is a multi-talented and prolific singer, songwriter, actor, filmmaker, businessman, and philanthropist. He grew up in Lagos, where he began singing in church at an early age. He then moved to New York, where he earned a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. His debut album, Undeniable the EP, was released in 2003 and this propelled him to the forefront as an independent musician. Mr. Banky Wellington served as executive producer and lead a and for some of the continent's most successful albums, including WizKid's smash hit field, debut album, Superstar, Ayo, and many others. As an accomplished writer, many of his articles have been published with Nigerian newspapers, blogs, magazines, and other media platforms. As a philanthropist, he founded the Banky Wellington Organization through which he spearheads and partners with other organizations for charitable activities. He also established the I Am Capable Scholarship Fund, which has provided educational assistance for deserving youth over the years at the tertiary education level in Nigeria, the USA, and Canada. He is married to Nollywood actress Adesua Etomi Wellington, and they are blessed with a son. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Mr. Banky Wellington. All right. Good morning. It's actually evening here in Lagos, but we will respect the time zone difference and say good morning. It is truly a pleasure and a privilege to be able to connect with all of you today. Uh, I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to be here to share. I want to give special recognition to Pastor Tola and the entire church conference team who have put this amazing conference together. I want to appreciate you for inviting me to participate. But I also want to challenge you because when they first told me that Pastor Tola wanted me to speak at the conference some months ago, I was excited because I thought I was going to get flown out to Baltimore to come and be there with y'all in person. Um, but, you know, I guess the world has changed now. And, you know, it's good, you know, we get to connect um, regardless of time zone or time difference and um, distance. Um, but I was looking forward to being there with you guys in person. And I hope that the next time that I, I get to, to speak with you, it will be in person because I really, I really like that opportunity to connect. Plus my family lives in the Maryland area and I've not seen them in like two years. So I was trying to use it to see them, but anyways. Um, so thank you, uh, Pastor Tola. Thank you to the entire team for making this possible. Uh, we're going to get into this today. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about lessons in leadership, uh, and structure. Um, I know that I trust that you've been blessed by the conference thus far, and I hope you've been taking notes because honestly, you know, these kinds of conferences are always so powerful and impactful and uh, they're a great time. You know, we, we, we almost, you know, we, we, we get a almost like a spiritual and an emotional high from being in sessions like this and, and listening to, to people speak and share from their experiences. But it's really what happens after the conference that counts. You know, it's what happens after church on Sunday, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, through the week. It's what happens in the rest of your year when you are not sitting in this session um, that counts. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't been taking notes thus far, please try. Um, I know some people are probably in motion. And, and if you can't do it because of what you're doing right now, that's fine. But if you are somewhere that's stationary and you can take some time out while you're tuned into this conference, please try and write some things down. I think it'll help you. I learn by writing. So I take a lot of notes um, wherever I'm at. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I think I was told I have about an hour, maybe an hour and change. And I do want to address uh, specific questions that people may have. So I'm going to try and share for the first maybe 30 to 45 minutes um, um, as God gives me the grace, and then we'll try and tackle specific questions that people have um, for the remainder of the session if any of those questions come up. So like I said, today we'll be talking about lessons in leadership uh, and the importance of structure. Um, I'll be sharing some of the leadership lessons that God has taught me uh, that I'm still learning um, by his grace. And uh, the way we'll go about is that we'll start with the major point that we're going to make, uh, and then we'll back it up with some examples. Those examples would be a combination of 
perhaps real life examples from my life or from the lives of other people that I've um, studied or read about. Um, or there will be some examples from scripture because I know this isn't a church service, but at the end of the day, the church is not a building, uh, it's a body. Okay, and, and we are the church. So wherever we're at, church might just, just pop off. All right, so, um, so we'll get into the lecture now. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do the lesson. We'll do some real life um, examples, whether they're from, that's from my life, the lives of others, or from, from um, the lives of people in scripture. And hopefully that will help uh, to bring this, uh, to bring the points home. And so before I go any further, for everybody that's tuned in right now, wherever you are, um, whatever country you're in, whether you're at home, you're at work, you're in the church building, you're in school, or you're in a, you know, your office or your bedroom, I want you to do me a favor, stretch your hands as wide as you can. I'm serious, this is a real task. I want you to stretch your hands as wide as you can and give yourself a thunderous round of applause. I, I can't hear, are you, are you doing it? Tell yourself congratulations. Say congratulations to me and say it out loud. You know, you made the time to be here, to, to carve out some very precious time out of your day to be here in a leadership conference. That means to uh, a certain extent, you already identify yourself as a leader. Um, it could be in your home, it could be in your family, it could be on your job, even if you are not the boss. It could be amongst your circle of friends or your network. But in whatever facet of life that you are in right now or the one that you envision, you see yourself as a leader. That's why you're here in this conference. So I want you to tell yourself congratulations. Now, the second thing that I want you to do is give yourself a very big hug. Like give yourself a, a hug. Say, oh, say Pele. My Yoruba people will say Pele. Say, tell yourself Pele. Okay, say, hey, yeah, you know, I, I assume that there are enough Nigerians on the call. So you understand the intonations in, in my speech. And the reason I tell you to do that is because the minute that you decide to try and live up to your calling as a leader, it is inevitable that you will get both congratulations and condolences. So to congratulate someone means to praise them for an achievement. It also means to give them good wishes when something special or pleasant has happened to them. But condolence is an expression of sympathy when someone has gone through something difficult. And if you're truly going to be a leader, you will need to be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually prepared for congratulations and condolences, because I guarantee you, you will experience both in your journey. And it's not a curse. It's just the reality of life and leadership. So today I am going to focus, like I said, on some, some short lessons in leadership, um, coming more from the angle of self-leadership, because if you want to lead, if you want to improve or change your society or your organization, if you want to improve or change a situation, a good place to start is by improving yourself. And so I will start with the first lesson, and I hope you're writing this down. I'm trusting that you're writing this down. So the first thing, uh, the first lesson I want to make points about is character, character. Um, and luckily for you, every point or every lesson that I'm going to make today starts with the same letter, it starts with the letter C. So even if you are driving and you can't really remember everything, uh, it'll be easy for you to remember because of the way that I've entitled it. But also I want to encourage you to go back and watch um, the videos you know, after this. I, I think the church has made it possible for you to order the the session. So please make sure you go back and watch it. So the first point is character. What are we saying? Great destinies require great character. And the interesting thing about character is that no one can lay hands on you and impart character into you. Character can only be built by the experiences that you go through. So you will need a character that is big enough for the calling that God has placed on your life. You will need skin that is thick enough for the trials. Because the journey of leadership can be lonely and it can be difficult. And I don't mean to depress you, but it is true. Leadership is lonely. The moment you decide to step up, I said this earlier, the moment you decide to step up, answer the call on your life, rise above your current surroundings, you become a target. If you step out of the crowd, you become isolated. You become a target of the enemy. You immediately open yourself up to new levels of conflict. Because to whom much is given, much is required. 
So much will be required of you in your leadership journey. You will need the kind of character that can handle the destiny that God has prepared for you. And so when we talk about character, we're really talking about thick skin, right? So I, I was giving a, a message just like this in, uh, in Zambia recently. And I, I was having a chat with the minister and uh, the honorable minister for information in Zambia. And, you know, she, she'd been in, in, in public service for a while. She was a two term serving member of parliament, uh, which in the U S I think you, uh, we call it Congress in the U S or uh, the national assembly in Niger. By the way, as some of you may know, I'm running for house of reps in Nigeria and I will win in Jesus name. Somebody say amen. Um, but I was, I was chatting with this member of parliament and I said to her, do you have any tips for me, you know, as I proceed on this journey into politics and into public service? She said, I have two words for you, thick skin. And it's so true. For the, for the journey that you're going on, you need skin that is thick enough to withstand the trials that will come your way. And you don't know how thick your skin is until someone tries to cut you, until you go through something, until you go through something difficult or dark. That's when you know how tough you are when life tries to hurt you and harm you, but you're still standing. You need the skin that can withstand the good and the bad, the persecution and the praise. Now, there's a really great story in Acts chapter 12. We don't really have the time to read all of the scriptures that I may reference today, but I'll just tell you about it. And I'm sure you know it. I mean, this is Jesus House, Baltimore. There's no scripture that I'm going to open that you people don't know, okay? Um, but in Acts chapter 12, it's the story of when Peter miraculously escaped from prison. Um, and it says he was fastened with two chains in between two soldiers. And the angel shows up and it breaks him loose. You know, and Peter thought it was a vision and he didn't realize it was really happening. Uh, but until, you know, you know he'd, he'd gone through and, and broken out of the prison and everybody knows that story. Now, the interesting thing about scripture is that a lot of times we like to skip over to the to the highlights, right? The the good parts, the miracle, the the angel busting Peter out of the chains and out of prison, and that's that's where our minds immediately want to kind of go to is oh, you know, what ended up happening, right? But if you start at the beginning of that chapter, the Bible talks about King Herod persecuting believers. It says he killed James. Now, this is the James, right? One of the first two disciples that Jesus called is the same James that was part of Jesus's innermost circle. You know, there were 12 disciples, but then there were the three, you know, not the 12, the three, Peter, James, and John. Those were the closest to Christ. You know, he's, they're the ones that he took up on the Mount of Transfiguration, that James, James, the brother of John, one of the first two disciples, was beheaded. And then Peter was arrested, presumably to face the same fate. So how depressing is that? At the same time as the disciples and the apostles are living up to their calling and pursuing purpose and performing miracles and preaching the word and turning the world upside down, you know, and, and doing all these amazing things, at that very same time, they're targets. They're being targeted. They're being arrested. They're being murdered. And if you were Peter, before the angel comes and you're sitting alone in that jail cell, how does that feel? Knowing that your comrade, your comrade James has, been, has just been killed and you're up next on the, on the chopping block and you're isolated, you're separated from family, from friends, from freedom. It's lonely. Leadership is lonely. Sometimes it's sad. Sometimes it, it hurts. Sometimes you're actually afraid. You're scared. You're under pressure. You're stressed. And in verse three of that same chapter, it says, when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people. And that tells us that your persecution might please people. Sometimes the very same people that you are trying to help or lead, this the very same people that you are fighting for or praying for, the very people that you are called uh, uh, to lead. Sometimes your persecution will please those people. And I can tell you for free, it sucks. Uh, there was a great African leader called Benjamin Borombo. And he said, each time I want to fight for African rights, I only use one hand because the other hand is busy trying to keep away Africans who are fighting me. And that quote just kind of stuck with me. 
It's the one that is chasing purpose that gets the persecution. Because, you know, there are some people that it feels like the enemy doesn't really bother with, right? Because they don't bother the enemy. So you're the one that is called to be the light of the world. You're the one that is called to be the light in darkness. You're the one that darkness will have a problem with. For, uh, John chapter one from verse one to five says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness does not come or did not comprehend it. The darkness did not comprehend it. So is it any wonder that sometimes people do not comprehend you? Quit sitting around crying because people misunderstood you or people just, they don't comprehend you. They don't understand you. They're not meant to. We need to, to learn to free ourselves from the bondage of needing to be liked by everybody, whether that's in church or school or work or politics or your book club, your boat club, wherever. It's not actually possible for everyone to like you. Jesus Christ, by every account, was perfect. And even if you are not a Christian, reasonable minds, even in academics, have acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the greatest leader in human history. Okay, till date, he has almost 2 billion followers, and he has inspired more people than anyone else in human history. But people still disliked him so much that they killed him. Until this day, Jesus Christ does not have everybody convinced. About a third of the world's population practice some form of Christianity. That means two thirds of the world's people are just like, yeah, no, I'm not convinced, right? So we need to learn that we must free ourselves from the bondage of needing to be liked by everyone. Free yourself from the need for everyone's approval. I say this all the time. Don't get your validation from the comment section. You know, in these days of social media, you know, you, you, you know and, and I'm preaching to myself, or I'm, I'm speaking and teaching myself here too, because when we do a post, what's the first thing that you naturally want to do? You immediately, you post, you go to the comment section. Even if it's not your post, you see something that is interesting or funny or crazy or wild or whatever. It's almost like it's a natural inclination to immediately go into the comment section to say, okay, what do other people feel about this thing that I have put. Do people approve? You check the likes, you check the comments. It's like th there's this natural uh, uh, inclination that we have to seek approval from everyone, but we, we have to learn that we can't get our validation from the comment section. For me, the T in PTSD stands for Twitter. Twitter is the T in PTSD. For my mental health, I was just having a conversation with Adeso about this the other day. For my mental health, I have learned to disconnect from social media, especially Twitter, because that's where the mob thrives. And so if you are seeking for validation in the opinions of the masses or the mob, it's like spending all day in a trash can and then wondering why you stink. Because human opinions are fickle. They will honor you one day, they will hate you the next. They will crown you one day, they will crucify you the next. It only took six days to go from Palm Sunday, where people are saying, Hosanna in the highest, crown him, to crucifixion Friday. So people will always have opinions on what you should and shouldn't do, and how you should or shouldn't go about this journey that you're going on. But they are not your maker. your maker. You get your validation and your instructions from God not from people's expectations or their limitations on you. You know, some people will try to limit you because they've placed those limitations on themselves and they feel like because they cannot do what you are called to do, then you shouldn't be able to do it either. Now, coming into a, a real life example of what I'm talking about, I've never been dragged in my life. I told you the T in PTSD comes, for me, it stands for Twitter. Okay, post Twitter stress disorder. And the truth is, I've never been dragged in my life so much. Like the day, the day I said, oh, I want to get into public service. I want to get into government. I feel like we can do this better. We can't keep complaining. You know, the day I decided to stick my neck out, that was the beginning of my dragging. 
Uh, there's a great Greek philosopher called Plato who said that the punishment for not participating in politics is that you will end up being ruled by your inferiors. What Plato didn't say is that the punishment for participating in politics is that they will drag you like a generator. I know you guys live in America, so y'all don't know what I'm, you may have forgotten what I'm talking about. You know, there's a generator that you drag, those face me, I face you generators. Because the truth of the matter is people will drag you. They will throw stones at you. They will question you. They will criticize you. They will slander you. Sometimes it's people that don't even know you. They've never met you. They've never heard you speak. They've never interacted with you. But all of a sudden, because you are doing something that seems foreign to them or what they expect, they become suspicious. They don't understand you. They say things and it will hurt. They will drag your reputation through the mud, through the mud. And your natural instinct will be to want to fight to protect your reputation, right? So uh, for me, for example, in 2019, we were running for office and one day, I see it on Twitter, there's a troll account because you know people have all kinds of troll accounts that they use to just spread propaganda, fake news. A troll account comes online and says, oh, here's a picture of Banki and Adesua boarding a plane to Abuja to go and collect 250 million from the government. The thing was so absurd to me that I was, I was, I was actually, it, it actually, in the beginning, it felt so absurd and so ridiculous that nobody will pay it any mind. And the next thing I know, the tweet gathers steam and people start saying, oh, yes, that's what they're doing. You see, they there's no evidence. There's no shred of truth to what this account said. And yet people started heaping insults and dragging and saying, yes, they are all corrupt. This is what they are going to politics to do. And I'm now starting to try to, you know, by the time you answer one here, 10 have fired you here. By the time you answer two here, another 20 have come. And I was so, I was so taken aback by what people were saying and the dragging and the false stories. And, it, and that was just one of the instances. There was another one where they said, oh, I, he wants to be a politician. He skipped a line to go and uh, get a voter's card. Just things that were completely false. I still saw some the other day. And the truth is when people start saying things about you, your natural instinct is to want to engage and debate and argue that they're wrong because it is your reputation that they're dragging. But the challenge is this, if you're going to be a leader, we have to learn that our focus must be on building our character more than it is on fighting for our reputation at every turn. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some times that you must defend yourself. There are some times that you must battle, but not at the cost of building because it is your character that God is interested in. Can your character withstand the destiny that he has called you for? The book of Nehemiah is a fantastic example. They're trying to rebuild the, world of, the walls of Jerusalem. People are ridiculing Nehemiah. They're mocking him. They're questioning him. They're actively working against him. He's focusing on building. But when they had to, he told them, he said, that's why you have two hands. You use one hand to build. You put a building tool in one hand. You put a sword in the other. You build and you battle. So when you, you battle when you absolutely have to, but you never stop building. Okay, and that's the thing about character. I said this before, great destinies require great character, but character cannot be prayed into you. No one can lay hands on you and give you character. Character can only be built through perseverance, through endurance, through going through difficult circumstances, through going through storms, okay? In my early Twitter days, this is what I'm talking about Twitter, I used to engage with everything. Uh, if you come for me, you better be prepared because I'm going to come for you. I remember one time there was a girl that abused me on Twitter. She said, ah, I don't like Banky W because he has a head like FIFA World Cup. I immediately retweeted her and I replied. I said, I don't like you because you have a face like Shrek. And I will go pound for pound. Anything, anyone, whether it's a joke, whether it's an insult, whether it's a rumor, whether, and I would go pound for pound with people. And over time, God taught me to hold my tongue and to prevent myself of feeling the need to give in to the urge to engage in every battle. 
the more he's taken me on this journey, the more he's taught me to hold my tongue, the more he's taught me to learn on focusing on building my character. There's something that I learned. I heard this from a pastor, uh, Pastor Ramsey, somebody that I listen to all the time. Meekness is not weakness. Don't get it confused. Meekness is not weakness. When Jesus was standing there being spit on and abused and insulted and mocked and beaten and dragged, to the average person, he would have looked weak. He could have opened his mouth and called down angels and fire from heaven. He could have cursed those people for what they did to him. He could have at least responded and engaged with them. But the last thing that he said until he hung on the cross was when they, they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you the son of God? He said, yes, that's where I am. From that point on, he said nothing. He, he refused to give in to the urge to respond. Okay, because he had his eyes on a greater destiny that was ahead of him. And that's, I think that's the lesson for us is keep your eyes on the destiny. Keep your eyes on the race that you're running. Don't engage in everything. Meekness is not weakness. It is strength. It is wisdom. It takes more strength to hold your tongue and to shut up than it does to speak. There's, a, there's, there's an urge that we have to fight to give in, uh, um, to want to revenge, to, to respond and revenge. And here's the thing. Revenge is not wrong. Revenge is not wrong. Vengeance is not wrong. It just does not belong to us. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Revenge is not wrong. It just does not belong to us. Resilience is our job. Revenge is God's job. All right. So we're, talk we're still talking about character. There's another thing I want to talk We talked a little bit about thick skin. There's another thing I want to say about character, and that's really to focus on humility. Now, don't mistake uh, humility for insecurity, because they're not the same thing. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. And the truth of the matter is, it is a spiritual principle that God honors humility. It's a spiritual principle. In 1 Peter 5, 5, James 4, 6, it says the same thing. God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So, uh, that word opposes, it literally means you guys are in America. So, you know, like, like when you're watching American football, the NFL, and the Baltimore Ravens are playing against another team. That word opposes means that God is literally playing like a linebacker for the other team. So that when you are, when you are prideful, when you are giving in to pride, God is literally playing for the opposite team as a linebacker to prevent you from running through. And I don't know about you, but I want to be on God's side. I don't want him to be opposing me. The Bible says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Luke 14, verse 11. I know it's not a sermon, but I do have some scriptural references. Forgive me. Luke 14, verse 11 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Is it any wonder that that God honors humility so much that the king of kings was born in a manger. And we romanticize mangers. We, 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 we romanticize uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, right? We say, silent night, holy night. Listen, I, we, we have a son. I've witnessed the birth of a child. There's nothing silent about it. There's nothing, all is calm. All is chilled. Oh, it's so nice. No, there is, is a hectic night. It's a stressful night. There's crying. There's pushing. There's stress. There's sweat. You know, it's hectic. And now to do all of that in a manger, you know, where farm animals are, where they use the bathroom, where, you know, it's smelly. Like, But that just shows you that that humble beginning, that's what God wanted, right? And even when Jesus grew up and after he'd done miracle upon miracle, he still got down and washed his disciples' feet. God honors humility. It is a spiritual principle. We're talking about character still. There's a story that I've shared before I'd like to share with you guys. Many years ago, before Nigerian music became what it is, the global, you know, behemoth that is, you know, taking over radio stations all over the world. Many years ago, at this point in time, we had never had a major Nigerian concert. Um, and what I mean by that is, 
in the States, you know, now it's it's almost commonplace to see some of our artists doing like Madison Square Garden or Barclays Arena or some of these massive arenas in the States or even in the UK, like the O2 Arena. Back in, in this story that I'm telling you, back then it had never been done. Most of the time when you're doing a Nigerian show, it was some small restaurant or lounge or a uh, club or something somewhere, some car or somewhere. In any case, um, there was a guy who said, you know, he wanted to put his money where his mouth is or just, we all believed that the day would come that Nigerian music would take over the globe. So this, this friend of mine said, oh, he was going to, he was going to invest and fund um, a concert. And it was in the DMV area. I don't remember which arena it was. I think it was in Baltimore and I don't remember the name of the arena, but some of you who were around back then, you know what I'm talking about. So he booked this, you know, really big venue. Um, and and we were gonna, then there was going to be this show. And there were three main artists who were going to perform at the show. There was the um, headliner who everybody at the time was coming to see. He was the one with all the hit songs. He was the one with the storied career. He was the one who had done, you know, really amazing things uh, in Nigeria, around Africa, around the world. So really this concert was all about this guy. Um, and then there were two other artists. One was an old school artist who, you know, he was maybe a headliner back in the day, but, you know, he was an old school guy now. He's really, really like an elder in the music business. Um, he still played uh, and sang a bit. So they brought him to kind of put a little bit of an old school flair to the show. And then there was an upcoming artist, somebody who was just starting out at the beginning of his career. So there were these three artists, the headliner, the old school guy, and the upcoming guy. And they do the show, you know, the, the, um, the old school guy and the upcoming artist kind of set up the show as they would. And then the headliner comes and, you know, he's the one everybody came to see. We have this, this amazing show and then it's over. And after the show is the after party. I know I'm talking to a church crowd, but I know you guys know what I'm talking about. So at the after party venue, they have it all set up, you know, the VIP section for the headlining artist as they should have done. So they have the velvet ropes and, you know, they, it's sectioned off with, you know, his tables and his drinks and the security personnel and the staff, the way, you know, everybody's all kind of on standby for the uh, headliner to come. And the, uh, the upcoming artist and the old school artists arrive. And, you know, they have a little small stool up somewhere because they've not reached that level of success in their lives. So they have a small stool and chair somewhere up on the side somewhere for them to sit. And the headliner comes there and immediately realizes that they had honored him and really just kind of discarded these other artists who had participated in this show and opened for him. And he immediately says, no, 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 please, we're all artists. We all deserve the same kind of treatment. Please remove these ropes. He goes there, you know, speaks to them and says, oh, will you guys please join me? This section is for all of us. And he basically humbled himself to to allow the others around him. He thought of himself a bit less and, and elevated the status of these other two artists. Now, the old school artist was Majek Fashek. The upcoming artist was me. The headline artist was Tubaba, Tufei Dibia. And I love that story because we remember we said, God honors humility. Tubaba, like myself, like everybody else has had We've all had our fair share of issues, problems, challenges that we need to walk through. But I believe there's a reason why his career has lasted so long. I mean, we're talking two, three decades. Because anybody that knows him and has spent time with him will tell you the guy is a humble guy. He's a humble man. You meet him, you feel like he's somebody that you've known all your life. He, he displays humility. And I've experienced it. And I've since gotten to know him. That was the first time I engaged with him. But I've gotten to know him over the years. And I can tell you for a fact that he's a humble guy. And what are we saying? You need thick skin in your character, but you also need humility. God honors humility. It's a spiritual principle. Let's move on because I think I've taken so much time and I've not even really gotten to everything that I want to talk about. The next point I want to make uh, is about commitment. The first one was character. Second one is about commitment. Com commitment talks about consistency you know we're talking about self-leadership here consistency being consistent in your focus being disciplined in your duties 
Greatness takes grace and grind. The grace comes from God. The grind comes from you. So what are you committed to? What are you consistent with? How are you uh, um, committed in your day-to-day -day, uh, delivering of your duties, in the discipline of duty? Uh, the, there's a great story in scripture about when Samuel anointed David to become king. And, you know, he anoints David to be king and most theologians put David at the point of him being anointed. He was somewhere between eight and 15 years old. So he's really, really young. Now, I don't know about you, but if the prophet of the land at that time came, put oil on your head and said, you are the next ruler of the nation, the very next day, you are probably walking around with, you know, a level of high shoulders, you understand? Natural shoulder pad. Because you're going to be king, you know, someday. But if you really track the story of David, what happens after that? He goes back to being a shepherd boy. He goes back to tending sheep. He goes back to being an errand boy. He goes back to being disciplined in his duties. In fact, the day that was going to change his life, the day that he killed Goliath, he was tending sheep. They said, oh, his father said, oh, come, take this food to your brothers that are on the battle line. He, the Bible says he, he left his things with the, he left his, his stuff with the keeper of things and then went to go and see what was happening. So there's a level of commitment. There's a level of consistency. There's a level of discipline that you see there. You know, when, when, uh, when we read about how when Saul, they were looking for a musician for Saul and they said, oh, there's a boy. I mean, I mean, I've had a music career. I can tell you that the commitment level that you need to be so good that when they are looking for a musician, for the ruler of the nation, they come and look for you. David is probably the greatest songwriter in the history of the universe because here we are 3,000 years later, we're still quoting his songs. We're still singing his songs. We're still writing songs from the songs that he wrote. What level of commitment do you have to to be the shepherd boy to be the errand boy to be tending sheep but to still find time to be writing to find time to be practicing your skills as a musician that when they are looking for a musician they come for you to still be a great warrior to be a fighter to be a soldier that talks about commitment destiny is launched from the discipline of duty okay victories occur on the battlefield but they originate in the training so David is working multiple jobs, but he still found time to be a great musician. He still found time to commit to writing, to learning, to listening to, to his lyrics. It takes thousands of hours of pure dedication. So many of us are stuck in the day-to-day -day responsibilities and requirements of our lives that we refuse to take the initiative to commit to self-development in any other area. So you don't go from knowing how to sing, to singing at the Grammys or to winning awards, you put in the work. Greatness is something that you are blessed with, but it is also something that you work at. It's not leadership, greatness, you work at it. You spend a significant amount of your time alone working out of everyone's sight. You're learning, you're practicing, you're developing, you're training, you're improving yourself, you're improving your skill sets. Dedicate some of your time to becoming better at something. We spend so much of our time on phones these days. We spend them on, on our devices. We spend it on social media. I'm talking to myself. I'm not just talking to you guys. We spend so much of our time in WhatsApp, sending forwards, reading forwards, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Is there any, have you ever thought that maybe that's why they call it a feed? They call your timeline a feed because you are literally feeding your mind, you're feeding your soul, you're feeding yourself on just information after information. And it's like, maybe that's why the Bible says, uh, um, beware of the devices of the enemy. So if we're going to spend so much time on our devices, how about we use it to, de to develop ourselves, to get better, to pick up a new skill. I learned how to cook from Google and YouTube. Ask my family, they'll tell you. Uh, you can learn a foreign language. You can pick up an instrument. You can listen to messages, listen to sermons. You can take uh, uh, leadership lessons. There's so much that you can commit to in your time on just developing yourself and getting better. I want to tell you a bit about Kobe Bryant.
Okay. Now we all know who Kobe Bryant is, you know, he's passed now, but in high school, Kobe Bryant used to show up to practice at 5 a.m. and leave at 7 a.m. Because school started at about 7.38. So he would show up, he would get up from his house, go to school at 5 a.m. just so that he could practice before school starts. When he made it to the NBA, his former coach came in early to work one day. Practice was scheduled for 11 a.m. And it was about, you know, 8.39. So all the lights in the gym were off. Coach gets to the gym a couple hours early to do some admin work. Here's the ball bouncing on the court. Goes out to see what's happening. And there is Kobe Bryant shooting in the dark hours before anyone else would even arrive because he was learning how to score in, dif in difficult situations. A former teammate of his said in the 99-2000 season, Kobe broke his wrist, uh, his wrist on his shooting hand, which was his right hand. And he thought that that meant for the first time, Kobe would not you know, come to practice the next day, or at least not be the first one in the gym. Except when this teammate gets to practice the next day, Kobe is already in a full sweat with a cast on his right arm, dribbling and shooting with his left hand. Chris Bosch and Dwayne Wade, two incredible Hall of Fame players in their own right, said that during the 2008 Olympics, on the first day of training camp, the whole team came down at 8 a.m. for a team breakfast before practice, 8 a.m. Kobe walks in with his trainers with ice on his knees, completely drenched in sweat. While everyone else had just woken up, still yawning, Kobe was already three hours and a full workout into his day. What are we saying? We're talking about commitment. Commitment to self-development, commitment to getting better, to doing better. You say you want to do great things for God, fantastic. You want to build the biggest business, okay. But how about you just start showing up to your job on time? and being disciplined in your duty on your job. You want to own your own home, but how are you treating the place that you are renting? You don't wait until you get into your promised land before you display commitment and integrity. Like Joseph, it is the integrity and the commitment that you display that will propel you into your promised land. God will always do his part, but we have to do ours. All right? So I want to move on quickly because there's a lot of time that has gone. And I still have quite a few things I want to touch on. So we'll move to the third point. First point was character. Type it in the chat if you're here with me. First point was character. The second point was, type it in the chat, commitment. Okay. The third point that I want to make is courage. The dictionary meaning of the word courage is the ability to do something that frightens you. It means strength in the face of pain or grief. Strength and confidence to move forward in the face of uncertainty. So faith requires courage. Faith lives in the space where you're moving forward with confidence, even when you are uncertain and unsure. Can you muster the confidence to try to push forward, to change course if you have to, but to keep going even in the face of uncertainty? And I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about courage. And it's a lesson that God has been instilling in me a lot these days. And, and I've been speaking on it uh, here in Nigeria uh, at the Waterbrook, uh, when I went to speak in Zambia, just this, this idea of courage. Now, I will crave your indulgence. I will maybe don't bother about turning to scriptures. I'll just read it. Um, and then you can make notes and, and check it out later. But uh, it's, in, it's, a, it's a little known story in 1 Samuel chapter 14 um, from verse one. And it's about Jonathan. So it says, one day, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Now, a bit of background context real quick. At this time, uh, the Bible says that there were no blacksmiths in Israel. So there were no, Israel didn't have weapons. So they didn't have enough weapons. They didn't have enough people. They were outnumbered on every side. The Philistines and, and all of the enemies were terrorizing them. And so it, it, that's, that's the context for where we are. So they, they are at war or they're supposed to be at war and they're surrounded on every side. And uh, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, he says, come on, let's go to where the Philistines uh, have their outposts. It also says that he didn't tell his father what he was doing. So 
What that means to me is that we must be careful about who we share our plans with. We must be careful about who we share our visions with because not everybody, you know, we said this earlier, not everybody believes or has the same faith level as you. Some people are going to immediately try and put limitations on you. So you have to be careful about who you uh, share your plans with and, and your ideas and your visions and the things that you want to go for, you have to be careful about who you share it with. Jonathan intentionally didn't tell his father who was the king. So protocol would have required that he should have told the king. But some people know that sometimes it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Because I'm sure if he asked for, for permission, King Saul wouldn't have let him go. Let's get back to the story. So it says, meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on the outskirts of Gibeah around the pomegranate tree at Migron. They're camped around a tree. Saul's men, among Saul's men was Ahijah the priest who was wearing the ephod, the priestly vest. Ahijah was the son of Ichabod's brother Ahitob, the son of Phinehas, son of Eli. Forgive me if I'm butchering the names, but you don't know how to pronounce them properly either. So just accept it like that. Um, uh, so Ahitob, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord who had served at Shiloh. No one realized that Jonathan had left the Israelite camp. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sener. Now, the, uh, that's important because Bozes and Sener, one means thorny, one means slippery. So he had to go through a thorny and a slippery place to get to this outpost where he was going to go. Um, and for me, that just means God didn't promise us that it would be easy, but he did promise us that we will have the victory. Okay, the presence of difficulty, the presence of, of, of difficulty does not mean the absence of the will of God. God doesn't promise easy, but he promises victory. Okay, let's go to verse um, six. So Jonathan says, let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. Now, many people would focus immediately on the part where he says, God can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. And I think that is amazing. And that's something to be celebrated. I focus on the word perhaps. Jonathan said, perhaps the Lord will help us. Perhaps. Perhaps. So he's saying, essentially, maybe, I don't know for sure if this is going to work out, but maybe, perhaps. What I do know is that it is not his will for me to stay here in fear and insecurity in this uncomfortable place. And sometimes being uncomfortable where you are is a sign that you need to go to another level. So Jonathan is saying, I know for sure that it's not his will for me to be where I am. So. I don't know where this journey is going to take me, but maybe. And how many people know that it's easier to redirect something that is already in motion than it is to get it to go when it's at a, stand, a standstill? And that's the beauty of maybe. That's the power of perhaps. That's what faith is. Faith is the willingness to push forward on perhaps. That's what it looks like. It's confidence and it's uncertainty. It's instinct and insecurity. He's saying God can win with many warriors or a few, but perhaps he can win with, with me and you. So let's go. Let's do this. Somebody type in the chat. Let's do this. Okay. Watch what his armor bearer says in verse seven. He says, do what you think is best. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. So Jonathan, by the way, some of us, if we're the armor bearer, we're saying, Oga, the king is there. You didn't go and greet him. You didn't go and ask him. The priest who has the effort, which is the way that they used to seek the voice of God, is there. You have ignored all of them. You are not telling me that this is where you want to go and this is what you want to do, on perhaps. Some of us would have been like, okay, bro, I wish you the best. God bless you. I'll be praying for you. Let me know how it goes. I'll see you when you get back. But the, but the armor bearer says, I'm with you completely. Okay. And every one of us needs an armor bearer. I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, verse eight. All right, then, Jonathan told him, we'll cross over and let them see us. 
ladies and gentlemen, his brand new world innovative strategy to go and fight is we will cross over and let them see us. He says, if they say to us, stay where you are or we will kill you, then we will stop and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up and fight, then we will go up. That will be the Lord's sign that he will help us defeat them. I want to remind you that in all the verses we've seen thus far, you have not seen anything say, thus says the Lord. The voice of the Lord came to Jonathan. Thunder and lightning shook the skies. Okay? This plan of Jonathan's is hilarious. He says, we'll go over and expose ourselves to them. That's it. That's the plan. Enter the enemy territory. He didn't even say sneak up on them. He said, just expose ourselves. So Jonathan is making this up as he goes along. And the truth of the matter is, we are all making it up as we go along. Nobody knows everything. That's God's job. He's all-knowing. None of us are. None of us are. We're making it up as we go along. We're, we're going to a certain degree off of instinct of, of where we feel the nudge. Now, the interesting thing about that scripture is earlier it says Saul was under a tree. The priest that was wearing the ephod, for those who, who may not know, and this is a redeemed place, so I know you probably know this, but the ephod was a priestly garment that they used to seek the voice of God. So there were stones on it, and based on whether the stones lit up or whatever the case may be, sometimes that's how they would hear God. God would speak through the stones. And, you know, when, when you think about it now, I'm like, okay, God, it would have been nice if we all had an effort where there were stones and say, oh, God, should I take this job? Should I start this business? The stone lit up. That means God said yes. The stone doesn't. God said no. But we have something better than an effort on a priest. We have the spirit of God. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of us. So you have to trust that you carry the spirit of God on your inside. And, and he's the one leading you. Okay? And so we're figuring it out as, we, we, as we're going along. There's a miracle in maybe. A lot of times, the, the great steps of faith, the great works of faith don't make sense to the people who don't have that same faith. Even in business, the great businesses, if, if you track the story of, of uh, uh, say, a, a Apple, back to the beginning, it's still faith. The guy still, Steve Jobs still had faith that, man, I, there's something that we can do here. Okay, that's, that's what this is. Uh, uh, um, Peter, we read about Peter walking on water. You step out of a fully functioning boat onto water. You decide to use a stone to stone a giant, David. You, uh, uh, every great act of faith, there's a little bit of maybe in there. There's a little bit of perhaps in there. I can trace everything great that has ever happened in my life. Almost everything great that has ever happened in my life. I can trace it back to a moment where I said, well, I don't know. But maybe, okay, Pastor Blessed and Mercy Chimo, they're fantastic, amazing friends of mine. PB was asking me, you know, he had gone through some things, you know, he's thought for a while that maybe he wasn't meant to date, he'd never get married. You know, we, we canceled that. Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. So we focus on delighting ourselves in God and God will give us the desires. And fast forward some time later, you know, he was like, he called me one day and he's like, oh, P. Max, you know, I don't know how far this messy babe, you know, I, I'm thinking that, in fact, let me ask you a question. How did you know when you met her this one that you should approach her, that she was the one that you should, you should ask out? I said, my brother, I didn't know. It was perhaps, it was maybe, boy, it's like, it's possible that, and that's what it is. You know, in fact, when I was, when I used to pray, you know, we give God rules and instructions, and this is how I want you to do what I want you to do in my life. This is when I want it. This is how I want it. And I used to tell God, ah, I don't want somebody from entertainment for my eventual wife. I want somebody that's in oil and gas or telecoms or aviation. You know, me, I already have a crazy up and down job in entertainment. It's too unpredictable. I want somebody that has stability. God brought me an actress. The actress that God brought me, she used to tell God that she didn't want a politician. She didn't want a pastor. She didn't want a musician. Ladies and gentlemen, I am all, everything that she said she didn't want. That's what God does. But because God's ways are higher than ours, all right? But it still comes back to the moment of saying, perhaps, maybe. 
when I moved back to Nigeria, I used to live in Yankee. He was just like, you know what? Maybe we can move back to Nigeria and set up a record label. And maybe my music can work and other people can, we can set up a home for other people to launch out and get their own music careers going. And it started from that, from transitioning from a label into an agency. Now all of the work that we do in the corporate space it comes back to that moment of saying, maybe, perhaps. When we wanted to get into film, again, it's back to that moment of saying, maybe. When I wanted to ask Adesua out, it's back to that moment of saying, perhaps. There is power in perhaps. Jonathan said, that will be the sign that God has given them into our hands. Okay? He's like, perhaps God will do it. Whether he has many words or he has a few, it's possible. So maybe he's going to do it with me. There's a great man called Zig Ziglar. And he said, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. So you have to start, start something, take a step. Whatever that vision is, whatever that idea is, whatever it is that you know that God is calling you to lead, to do, to write, to be, to build, start something. Jonathan said, perhaps. Everybody has ideas. Everybody has thoughts. Everybody has visions. You know, we say things like, it's the thought that counts. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not the thought that counts. It's the courage that counts. It's the action that counts. It is the, the willingness to push forward on perhaps. Okay, and for you may be listening to this right now and you feel like, man, there were things that you felt like you were supposed to do, a person that you were called to be and too much time has passed or you made too many mistakes. I've got great news for you. You are not powerful enough to mess up the plans that God has for your life. As long as you are still alive and there's breath in your lungs, they still hope that you can achieve what God has called you to achieve. God is the script writer, the director, the producer, the editor of your life's movie. You're just an actor. The actor doesn't determine how the movie ends. The director does. Okay, so trust the director. People ask me, oh, you know, why are you running for office? Because I feel like I'm meant to. I feel like I'm called to run for office. I have a burden for it. I'm uncomfortable with where things are. And I know that where things are, this cannot be the will of God for us to be in this situation as a nation, for us to be in this oppression, in this poverty, in just in this downtrodden state. That's not the will of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 verse two, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in power, the people mourn. It, this can't be it. This can't. And you know, so we're going to push forward on perhaps. We're going to say we're going to get in there. We're going to get into the system. We're going to do what we need to do to transform the system from inside by the grace of God. And we know we're greatly outnumbered, but we believe that we are called to be Joseph in Pharaoh's palace. We're called to be Daniel in Babylon. We're going to go in there. We're going to educate ourselves on the ways of the system, but we're going to shine the light of God in that darkness. And we don't have everyone that we thought that we would have. We don't have all the money that we need, but we have God and we have faith and we have the possibility of perhaps. We have the miracle that is in maybe. Maybe God, maybe us, maybe now. Let's find out. The last thing that I want to touch on is counsel. We talked about character. We talked about commitment. We talked about courage. I want to talk about counsel. Jonathan picked his armor bearer as his counsel. You can't go on this journey alone. Sometimes you need armor bearers for the vision that God has called you to do. Sometimes you are the armor bearer for somebody else. Now, I, I do want to spend just maybe five minutes saying a couple of things that take this as, as a bit of counsel for, for those who are in business um, uh, because I think this is this is really important because sometimes people listen to messages like this and they just, you know, they, they want to rush out and do something. I think... And this is where the whole uh, idea of structure comes into place. Now, the assumption that everybody who ever becomes an entrepreneur or starts an NGO or an organization or you know, a company or a business, the assumption that we all tend to make is that if you understand the technical work in a business, then you understand the business that does that technical work. That assumption is false. I'll say it again. The assumption that if you understand the technical work in a business, then you understand the business that does that technical work. That assumption is false. What do I mean? Everybody who's ever become an entrepreneur 
has a light bulb moment, right? Maybe you work for a company most of the time, 99 times out of 100, you're working somewhere, you're working for a boss, you're working for a company. And then you get to that place of frustration where you're like, oh, I should be in business for myself. I shouldn't have to report to anybody. I should branch out and do something. And a lot of times that thing that you want to do is tied to that technical skill that you're delivering for somebody else. So you, um, maybe you are, for just to simplify it, you bake pies in a pie shop. And you're like, you know what? I'm really good at making this food, these pies or whatever. I should start my own restaurant. But just because you know how to cook, you understand the technical skill of cooking, doesn't mean that you have the skill to run the business that, that provides that result, okay? And you have to be very careful that the business that you want to start, that you want to escape to, does not become what enslaves you. So if your business depends on you working in it, then you don't have a business, you have a job. And it is the worst job in the world because you can't close it when you want to, because if you close, uh, you don't get paid. You can't leave when you want to, because if you leave, there's no one there to do the work. You can't sell it because nobody wants to buy a job. So be careful that you are not creating a, a, a job instead of actually creating a business. I was chatting with a friend of mine and she was a, a, a girl here in Nigeria. And she was like, oh, you know, I saw what you 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 and Olamidu have built with Suya Bistro. You know, I, I'm really good at chin chin and all these kinds of snacks. I really want to, to branch into business for myself. I said, okay, that's fantastic. She said, oh, the challenge I have, I've actually started it too, but I'm the only one that knows how to make chin chin like this. I'm the only one that knows how to make the pastries that I want to sell like this. And so I must be there to do it. And I told her, I said, if, if your business depends on you working in it, you don't have a business, so you have a job and you will never be able to fire yourself from that job. And there's a limitation to how far the job can go. A business is a system that you set up to produce a result. So don't set up a job, set up a business, set up a system. Even if in the beginning you are the one, and this is going to the, to the because I wanted to touch on structure briefly. Even if you, are, you do your organogram and you say, okay, I need this marketing, I need sales, I need finance, and it's your own name that is in all those places, your goal is to work and to grow enough where you're able to fire yourself from these individual um, parts of the structure that you've set up. But start with the structure. Start with the, the vision for what you want the business to be, how you want the business to behave, to achieve that result. And then start to fill in people into that structure so that the structure produces the result as opposed to you producing the result yourself. It's just a little bit of advice for people that are going into business. Um, because at the end of the day, if your business does not explode, you might explode. One cylinder cannot produce the results of 12. So plan, envision, articulate what you see in the future for yourself, for your employees, for your business, and then start to shape your reality to fit that vision. The goal of your of your goal as an entrepreneur, and I'm speaking specifically to entrepreneurs here and people who are going to lead organizations and companies. The goal is to build a business that works without you, not because of you. The goal is to build a business that works without you, not because of you. Okay. So first of all, start with why. Uh, why do you want to do this particular business? Why is it this idea? Uh, this suya bistro. This agency, this pie shop, this restaurant or hair salon or whatever it is. Why is it? Why is that a good business? Envision the life that you want to live for yourself in five years. What does that life look like? What kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to have two cars? Do you want to be able to take your family on vacation once a year? Envision that life and then try and put together, financially speaking, the amount of money you need to be earning to be able to fund the life that you eventually want to live, okay? When you think through that, then you say, okay, how much money does my business need to be earning that after taxes and you know costs and all of that in this five years time, how much money does it need to be earning for, for me to be able to live the lifestyle that I've envisioned? Then you now know how much your business needs to be able to generate. And that is what helps you answer the question, should I go into this line of business or not? 
is there enough of a market? Is there enough of a demand for me, for my business to produce the kind of results and to, to bring in the kind of success that will allow me live the kind of lifestyle that I want to live at that time? But once you have that idea, whether it's a business, whether it's an organization, whether it's politics, whether it's ministry, whatever, bringing this back to a close, let's go back to the point of courage. It's not the thought that counts. It is the courage that counts. And with these few points of mind, I know I've gone way over my time, but with these few points of mind, as my Niger people will say, I hope I've been able to convince you and not confuse you. Uh, thank you so much. And that's all I want to share. Um, today. Thank you, Pastor Tola. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Banky Wellington. Uh, I really appreciate, uh, you know, your insight, you know, into our theme and our conference, thank you, sir. you know, today. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, I, I, I know you've been blessed today, but I want us to hold on for a few more minutes uh, because we have some questions that have come in, you know, and um, We'll just like to ask you a couple of questions before we allow you to go. Uh, number one is that talking about commitment, uh, the question says, so how has structure helped you in your dreams and your visions? For instance, we know that you know that, that you sing, we know that you are a politician, we know that you are a businessman, you know, and we all need commitment for those things to come to pass. So how has vision come to play with the commitment? Okay, um, for me, I think that, structure the role right that. that, yes, the role that structure has to play in the visions coming to pass. I think if you do not intentionally approach your dreams with structure in mind, then you are almost planning to, deal with a level of chaos that eventually can turn your dream on its head. So for, for me, for instance, there were so many things that I wanted to do, right? But the way that I thought through it was to say, hey, yes, I want to be in music, I want to be in film, I want to go into advertising, I eventually want to own a restaurant, I want to do all of this. Those were dreams that I've had since I was a kid. But one, you have to structure, um, what steps do you take first? Right. So for me, it started with let's attack the music first and not trying to do a million things at once. Just focus on my own musical career. You know, can I get this off the ground? Can that work? Now, the minute you put work into that and you see that that is starting to yield some results, then you start to shift the goalposts and then you say, OK, you know, can I bite off a bit more? You know, can I achieve a bit more? Can I shift the goalposts a bit more? For me, it was my music first um, and then the record label. And then after the record label, it was like, okay, what other things can we branch into film? You know, if I came out in the beginning and I said, oh, I, I want to sing. Oh, I've signed artists. Oh, I want to be an actor. Oh, I'm a director. Oh, I'm, you know, and I'm doing all of these things in the same breath. Then I would have spread myself so thin that I would not have achieved anything. So I think it's important to structure the steps that you're taking, you know, Map it out one step at a time. You can't achieve everything in one go, but you can take the first couple of steps and then reevaluate and then move from there. And then the second thing is setting up structure around the individual steps that you are even taking. So for me, you know, and for people who are in the music business, you know that, yes, you're an artist, but you can't be the artist and the manager and the lawyer and the PA and the booking agent and all of those things in the same breath. So like when we talked about Jonathan and his armor bearer, who are your armor bearers? What are the roles? Even if you don't have the people yet, but what are the roles that you know that you need in your organization, in your company? And even if it's your own name that is there, but knowing that this is the structure that my company needs or my organization needs or my dreams need to come true, think through that structure first and fill in your own name there and then be firing yourself from those roles as you build out and as you grow. And that then helps you um, create that structure and that system that will then help you um, get that desired result. I think for me, that's that's the way that I would answer that question. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much. You know, yes, I, I love the part, you know, that you talked about, you know, getting lawyers, 
or accountants because most of the times what people try to do is that they try to do everything by themselves and especially professional things. I always tell yes. people, don't cut your costs on attorney fees. Do it yeah. right. Pay someone yeah. who knows and understands, you know, the legal, you know, quite, yeah. um, wordings and things so that when you are writing out contracts or you are reading out contracts, they tell you precisely what it means before you sign so that you don't get two years mm -hmm. down the line. You are saying, what did I get myself into? I Absolutely. hope somebody is listening there. I, I have another question, you know, for you. Now, I know no doubt that you've gone through some of these things several times. Uh, as, as an artist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, a, a film producer and an actor and, um, you know, politician. How have you managed restructuring when most times restructuring affects people? You know, you've had to take someone out of a role and you mm -hmm. might probably not have another role for them in your organization. Uh, mm -hmm. People at times take this very personal. How do mm -hmm. you, how have you handled this? So that, um, you know, it doesn't mess up relationship at the end of the day. Right. So I think that that's, that's such a, a really, really great question. Um, I think that, first of all, it starts from having the mindset that, you know, especially when it comes to working with people, there are some people who God brings into your life that are meant to be there for life. Right. Like my wife, in Jesus name, by the grace of God. That's a lifelong commitment. Mm. Now, you will find, though, that in some seasons, there are people who at that season of your life, in that uh, point in the business or the project or whatever, they are so close with you that it feels like these guys are going to be around forever. But that doesn't end up being the case. It's like, you know, when you are... Um, when you see a building going up, the construction of a building, there's this thing they call scaffolding, right? Scaffolding is what they put up um, around the building as they're building it. Mm -hmm. And at certain points in the construction, the scaffolding is so close to the building that you actually can't get between, you almost can't get between the scaffolding and the building. That's how close they are together. But then at certain points, the scaffolding goes away. And the truth is some people are scaffolding. And you have to have that understanding that in your journey, there are people who in that season of your life, they're going to be so close with you. You're going to be working so closely together. And then in another season of your life, they're going to be gone because their purpose and yours are different or you no longer align. And you have to be able to say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, what you try to do, and it's not always possible, but what you try to do and this is a lesson that my mother used to hamper on to me, is that you don't burn bridges behind you. Yeah. And that means when that person goes away, when the scaffolding goes away, when the person, you know, you, you've gone your separate ways, do your best to, to maintain some semblance of a relationship. Do your best to live in peace. Um, because you don't want to, first of all, you, don't, you never know if you have to cross that road again. So you don't want to burn the bridge behind you, but also you don't want to sow seeds of resentment. You don't want to sow seeds of bitterness. You don't want to sow things that will come back and you won't know where you will reap it down the road. So one, accepting and understanding that some relationships just will not last forever. Two, being intentional about trying your best um, not to burn bridges, not to uh, destroy relationships, even though they are being separated, still trying to leave, leave them in a place of peace. Um, uh, and I think that would be it for me. And then the other thing I think is also understanding and, and you know, some of this will only come um, with insight from the Holy Spirit, but understanding when it is time to evolve, when it is time to go a different route, when it is time to try a different path or, you know, use somebody else in a role that you need. Um, so for us, you know, we did the record label thing for a very long time. But even while we were doing the record label thing, we were focused on how do we add value? Even as a label, we started doing the work that agencies do and people, 
companies that were doing the work that, that were using us for it were paying us through advertising agencies because they had to pay an agency, but we were the ones doing the work. And we were doing it with just a view to saying, you know, we're not going to be doing this record label thing forever. The music is a young man's game. You want to go on tour, you're on the road most of your year, you're traveling from city to city. It just, it felt like they would get to a point in time where we would want to evolve past that need to say, oh, uh, myself and Tunde, uh, uh, um, success is dependent on the last hit song that we put out or the last show that we performed at or the last endorsement deal that we signed. And so we started putting the building blocks in uh, uh, the foundation for where we knew that we wanted to evolve to and just kind of trusting God and, and, and just planning and strategizing, deciding when it was time to kind of pivot and you know, go in a different direction. And that meant you know, trying to give a soft landing to some of the artists that we had at the time and people who were more focused on the record label side of the business at the time, again, with a view to trying to you know, maintain that, that sense of peace and that sense of relationship, but very intentionally saying, hey, this is the direction that we need to go. And, and these are the people that we need to work with to go in that direction. And these are the things that we need to put in place um, to get there. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, let me tell you a story and uh, ask a question on a much you know, lighter note. Okay, sir. Um, I, I was in Nigeria many years ago and um, I, I went out to lunch with a preacher and uh, the very known preacher, you know, and um, <laughs> we were at this hotel and we were having lunch. And um, I think maybe 30 to 40 people came to our table to say hello to him. And uh, after a while, I asked him, I said, are we going to eat today? <laughs> or oh, you're going to be greeting people? <laughs> you know? and, and he said, this is the problem that he has. That, that's why it's difficult for him to go out. So do you go out at all to have lunch or dinner? <laughs> and, uh... um, so uh, the ironic thing with me, sir, is that I actually go out and I go out a lot. And not just to go and eat, I do the grocery shopping in my house, I go to the supermarkets, I go to the stores, because I have also always felt like I don't want to be a prisoner of fame that okay. says, oh, because I'm popular, I must hide and people can't see me. Now, it does come with, depending on where you go, a lot of people asking for pictures. But, you know, the way I look at it is you could very well be there and nobody cares. So the fact that people want to ask you for a picture or want to say hi or something like that is a sign that, you know, God has used you to touch them in some way. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that. So it inspires gratitude. Yes, there are some times that you're tired or stressed out and you're not really in the mood. Um, but I try to have that, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, that attitude of gratitude around where God has brought us thus far. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we're still here and still relevant. And I, and I try to approach it um, from that mindset. So okay. I don't let it hinder me from doing things, taking my wife out for a date or going to the grocery store. Um, but it does come with what you have described. And you okay. know, we just okay. we take it. Okay. We take it. Uh, so I also take note that when next we see, I'm going to take my own picture so that I can... Ah, no problem, sir. A whole photo I shoots. Can, I'm here for you. End up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, I want to appreciate uh, Bankale Wellington. Thank you, thank, thank you. you so much, you know, for a thought-provoking, you know, uh, session. And uh, we believe that um, we've taken one or two things, you know, uh, out of what you've presented today. And uh, we can only but wish you the best in everything thank that you, you do. And um, you, very soon, uh, hopefully, we'll start to call you Honorable Banky Wellington, you know, you know, and uh, we'll see you around. Thank you so much. So I'll hand over now to...